So we are on the last of the lessons from Lewis. How about that? Um, I, was, I could probably do about five years on all these quotes. Lewis, he's a prolific writer. Um, next week is... Isn't that crazy? Palm Sunday. And the week after that? I should have made an announcement about the... We do have sunrise service at uh, Sales Mail again. So we, we have it uh, uh, reserved. So... Uh, our sunrise service will be there. Mike, I guess I should have told you that. Sunrise service is going to be over. <laughs> so it's Mel again. And Eric, because Eric, <laughs> yeah, Eric will be up till then. Yeah, you, you <laughs> We're throwing people under the bus. Tammy got thrown under. Um, Eric is, is um, he's here every Sunday morning, right? How many other mornings are you up at this time? Very few, yeah. <laughs> Eric, Eric uh, the reason that he plays guitar so well is that he plays guitar a lot. So um, there's a lesson in that for everybody. If you want to be good at something, practice. I seem to have mentioned that about 15,000 times over the course of my years here. Anyway, back to uh, lessons and le- lessons for Lewis. As you can tell, we could, we, could, we could go anywhere today. This is crazy. They let me play guitar, man. How, how crazy is that? They let me play guitar this morning. Nothing is bad. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, let's get right into it. C.S. Lewis, this quote. This is our quote for today. Do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love them. As I began working on the quote above, it drew me to a somewhat familiar p- passage of Scripture, right? You all know it, right? The Great Commandment. Anybody know where that's found? Leviticus, right? <laughs> Leviticus 19.18, 8, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Not the place you were thinking, was it? That's not, wait, Leviticus is Old Testament. That's our New Testament teaching. Uh, well, it is in the New Testament as well, Luke 10, 27. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he also in Mark, when you see these things in Luke, Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, pay attention. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than this. And of course, Matthew as well. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, there's a word in there that we don't like much, we don't pay attention to all the time, but I'm going to take a look at it. We are commanded to do this task. We aren't asked. We aren't, if you feel up to it, we are commanded to love. Let that settle. Because Jesus goes way beyond what we think of when we think of love. Loving God is not as difficult, though it sometimes is, as loving some of our neighbors when we start to look at who our neighbors are. Jesus didn't make it easy at all because in Matthew 5, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, Sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. Be perfect, uh, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Luke repeats it. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, don't withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting repayment in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. 
lend to them without expecting to get anything back, then your reward will be great. You will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Now, at least it's only in two of the three synoptic gospels. So. And, and I, wanted to, I, I brought my, my um, gospel parallels in here. Do you, anybody know what this is? Have you, do you have one? A gospel parallel? Computers can do this too, but some of us like the book, you know, to have the book in your hand. But regardless, I encourage you to get one. What they are is Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels. And they're seen together, in other words. So it tells the story of Jesus. They're seen together. They tell a lot of the same stories, often in the same words, or very close, frequently in the same order. And uh, they're, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Luke provides somewhat of the same story. What's cool about this, this one is based off of Matthew, and I know you can't really see, but this is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So this is in Matthew. This is in Luke. And Mark doesn't. Mark is in the middle. So this tells you each of the places to find them and also what is said because they're parallel, right? They're saying basically the same story from a different author. One of the great things about the, the gospel is that, you know, Matthew shows us a little of the Jewish perspective. Mark gives his perspective. And uh, Matthew, or, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Is, is the Gentile, and, and he gives that perspective. We get three different views of the same story, and, and that's one of the strengths of the gospel because they're not exactly the same. If you're going to make up a story, it's going to be the same. If you're going to tell the story of an, an accident seen from where you are, there's going to be distinctions and differences. There are distinctions and differences. Encourage gospel parallel. Okay. I'm, I'm sure that that group on Tuesday night will... Oh, you're out of the Gospels now. I should have given this to you a long time ago. Um, Okay. Uh, Go deep is my, ultimately, go deep in your faith. And that requires study, and it requires, okay, how does this all weave together? Um, But the idea of loving our neighbor as ourselves has been around a long, long, long time. I use the Leviticus passage because we don't always connect that love your neighbor as yourself to the Old Testament. We're like, no, that's all Jesus and all New Testament. God's been saying this for a long time. You know, from, from Leviticus to now, he's telling us, love your neighbor. You know, that was written in the time of Moses, or at least it was known in the time of Moses whenever they got around to writing it down. It's millennia ago, thousands of years ago. God sent this message to his people. Then it was to the Israelites, now it's to all of us as believers. We'll be known how we love one another. Mike pointed this out. By this you'll know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. And Jesus tells us what that means. And it's like not just one another, but also your enemies. But all that aside, you know, the target that we shoot for, how we're going to be known is love. What does our love look like? Love one another, love our enemies, even those who persecute us, even those who falsely accuse us. Love them anyway. We don't always have to like somebody to love them. Let me be clear on that. But we need to love them. Love is a commitment. Love love is stepping into it. We are called, this is crazy, this is the craziness of Christianity. We are called to love terrorists. We are called to love people who do the most heinous things. We are called to love child molesters. It's crazy. Crazy. Our enemies, those who stand directly in opposition to us. Jesus says, you got to love them. It's easy to love the people who you like. It's easy to love the people who agree with you. Did you know that if you're a Democrat, you have to love a Republican? If you're a Republican, you have to love Democrats and Libertarians and everything else. In our current country, that's crazy talk too, right? We've got to learn to love and show it. Don't waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. Act as if you did. Do it. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you're behaving as if you love someone, pretty soon you come to love them. There's a recovery term. It's used by folks outside the recovery community. In fact, Mary Kay is, I guess, the one who... Uh, is getting credit for it now, although it's been around since before she was born, so I'm not sure that she gets credit, but still, fake it till you make it. (laughs) 
Take the right, and, and I don't, you know, take the right actions that are loving and be amazed at how things can change. But here's the caveat. Right? If you're doing it to try to get an attaboy or at a girl, that's not what I'm talking about. That's simply manipulation. We're not faking it till we make it as a manipulation. It's a true, I don't know that this is going to work, but I'm going to love you anyway. I'm going to take the step of love and see what happens because God says I'm supposed to love everybody. So I'm going to treat you with love. I'm going to be loving towards you. I don't like what you're doing, but by golly, I, you know, I still, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, love does, but by Bob Goff talks about, in, in I think it's the first chapter, a, a young life leader named um, Randy. And Bob was in high school. He decided he was going to leave high school and go to Yosemite. And he lived in California, go to Yosemite and work in the, in the mountains in Yosemite. And Randy just says, you're leaving now? Okay, I'm with you. He gets in with him. They go to Yosemite. He tries to get a job. He can't get a job. But Randy's with him. They camp. And eventually, you know, a couple of days later, Bob says, this isn't working out, so I'll go back home. And he gets back home, and he drops Randy off and uh, goes in the house, and he sees all these unopened presents. And he finds out that Randy had just been married. And rather than go on the honeymoon, he went with Bob to Yosemite because he was with him. He didn't try to change his mind. He went with him. He was with him all the way. Sometimes love does that. Sometimes it's a matter of doing, you know, I'm sure Randy was going, this is stupid, but I'm going to do it anyway because he was prompted by God to do it. Sometimes love does some pretty crazy stuff. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to us. So if we have to fake it till we make it, fine. Don't do that manipulatively, but just take that next step. We can hope for a healing response in a difficult circumstance, but we're talking about unconditionality. We're talking about agape. We're talking about God's Love here. Jesus loves us unconditionally. Did you know that you are loved by God? Doesn't matter where you come from, what you did, who you are, you are loved by God. Does he love everything that you're doing? He does not love everything that you're doing. He would like to see some change in your life that would draw you in a more towards him to be more Jesus-like. However, regardless of that, you are loved by God. You are loved right where you are, exactly what you're doing. You are loved wholly and completely by God. While we were yet sinners, he what? Died for us. He didn't say get better and come. We got to change that message. The church has that message hanging. I don't think we gave it to ourselves. It happened. We got to change that message. It's come. As you are. Meet Jesus. I have this abiding belief. I like that word. Don't use it very often, but I like it for this. An abiding belief that if you encounter the living God, you will be changed. We want that encounter to happen. So we meet, but you can't do it if they're not here, right? It's a, so come meet them. He loves us unconditionally. But even in the worst of struggles, Christ will not give up on you. He will continue to pursue you. He gives you ex opportunities to experience this changed life as a follower of Christ. You all know I'm recovering. And in 12-step programs, there are 12 steps. <laughs> uh, I thought it was funny. That's all that really mattered. <laughs> Step eight and nine, they're up there, on the, up there on the screen or down here on the screen. Step eight is to make a list of all persons we had harmed, become willing to make amends. Step nine is the actual making amends, except when to do so would injure them or others. No, it's not, well, that might make me uncomfortable. It had nothing to do with that part for you. It's whether it would hurt them. My first time through the steps, I reached step eight and nine, and I sat down with my sponsor, Ken Fisher. We had looked up... And a friend of mine, we, we looked him up, and he passed away two years ago, unfortunately, because I was encouraged to reach out to him. I hadn't in a long time. So. But Fish was a Vietnam veteran. Rough, salty, he was a Vietnam veteran, all of it. You know, your picture, that was him. I'm still not exactly sure why I chose him. I think in treatment, they said, choose somebody who's like you or somebody who's the opposite of you. I went with the opposite of me and um, regretted it in the beginning. Now I'm very grateful. Because he upset me a lot with the things he would have me do. You know, because he, he was not about tell me stuff. He was more about do. You know, what are you doing? So on this list, he told me to make the list of folks that I needed to make amends to. So I made the list. 
And then he told me to order them with the first ones, the men's that I was willing to make, and on the bottom, the ones that I was never, no way in Hades or hockey sticks that I was ever going to do, right? And I wasn't sure how that was going to help me with my sobriety, but fake it till you make it, right? He said to do it, I'm desperate, I want to stay clean and sober, so I did it, and I started in, a very weird thing happened. I began to experience the forgiveness of other people. People were genuinely happy that I I was doing this, that I was sober, that I was trying to do better in my life. They were genuine, not everybody, but most most of the folks were very receptive. And I, I, I got down into that list a little ways, and it's like, okay, I'll keep doing them. And I went all the way through that list, including... Some stores that I had to go to with this fear that they would have me arrested. I, you know, I wasn't a perfect angel, right? I stole, I, you know, did stuff, you know. And so I made restitution to some sto- stores that I had shoplifted and stolen from. And I had to go and tell them, you know. And they, they, <laughs> they weren't, oh, great, way, way to go. But they were happy that, you know, that this was happening. So it was very, very clear to me that, following direction from fish was was making a difference in my life by doing the next right thing you hear that from me a lot and here's why do the next right thing my life was overwhelming and I could not deal with everything if I tried to do everything I couldn't do anything because it was too much but you know what I can do the next right thing what's one thing and so that became a, a part of my life that continues to be that. Fish was a big part of that process because he was able to direct me to a healthy life, even though I didn't understand what he was up to all the time. And he was salty and gruff, but I'll tell you this. I called him up one day, struggling with the desire to drink. And I had told him that I would call him before I actually drank. And this gruff Vietnam veteran slowly, quietly, and lovingly walked me through my day. Okay, Mike, what'd you do today? And as a part of that, well, I just got up and I went out and, I, you know, he said, where's your daily devotion? I hadn't done it. Where's your prayer? And I hadn't done it. And he walked me back off the ledge. And next week, it's next week. Is March 27th next week? Wow. That's crazy. Uh, By the grace of God, 12-step communities, lots of support and uh, love from many, many people. I have not had to pick up a drink or do any dope since March 27, 1990. Isn't that crazy? uh, How many years is that? Wow. We have a big God. This is a guy who didn't stay sober for 30 days, let alone 30 years. The grace of God other people that were in my life telling me things that I didn't always believe. You know, he wouldn't sponsor me until, I, you know, he's an action guy. He told me, I asked him to sponsor me, he said, call me every day for two weeks and, I'll, and, I'll, and we'll talk about it. I didn't like calling people, but I called him every day for two weeks, you know, because I needed help. He had me make my bed in the morning. It made no sense to me, but you know what I did? Got up and made my bed in the morning. It wasn't until later that I found out that, that, that was a, for a, someone who was failing in their life, that was the start every day with a success. Every day that I made, got up and made my bed, I started with a success. Little things turn into big things. And the funny thing happened along the way with Fish. I came to love him and revere him, in fact. He's probably the reason I maintained my recovery. I didn't like him all the time, but he gave me the right actions. And the right action allowed positive things to happen in my life. And whether we like somebody or they're our enemy, we can still take the right actions. Don't waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you're behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love them. The beauty of that process that Lewis outlines is that it will work for anyone and everyone. Love is the ultimate power position. I don't know if you ever know this. It's the ultimate power position. And what I mean is this. When we choose to love, when we choose to love, it cannot be taken from us. It is in our power. We can love. The only way that goes away, the only way we relinquish it 
is by our own decisions, choices, and actions. No one can take your love from you. We have to give it up. It may cost us our very life to love in this way. It costs Jesus his. But no one can take that power away from you. You have to give it away. People can do the most heinous of things, but you can still love them. And I wanted to show this video. I forgot to tell you guys there's a video. It's a story of love and forgiveness that's very, very extreme. So here it is. When the genocide started, they started to kill people of my tribe. My parents sent me to hide to a neighbor who was from the other tribe. I went to him and he put me to sit in this bathroom. It was, it was during the day when I got there. And then the next morning, about three o'clock, he came and took me and showed me through the house with a torch. And then he showed me this tiny bathroom in his bedroom. And he put me to sit there. I'm thinking, this is too small for me. What am I going to do here? Because you think, what have I done? to deserve this anyway. You know, I'm just a student. And everybody loved me and I loved them. And, and there was nothing I can ever feel guilty about. And I'm thinking, here, this is a prison. So he went back, brought five more women. In the beginning were six. The youngest was seven years old. He went later, he brought two more women, were eight people, sitting on the top of each other. The bathroom was three by four feet, small eight of us for three months. For three months, one time they came to hunt for us. The killers hired by the government, fed by the government and drinks. And one guy stood outside. I can hear him. He went to school with me, primary school. And he spoke and he said, I have killed 399 cockroaches. That's how he called us. And he said, I want Imakile to be the 400. That would be a good number. And I'm thinking, somebody lost their mind? They don't remember that I'm a human being? What have happened to him? This is a man I would call a friend in a normal time, like when we were going to school. He was just a normal person. And he killed, he found later, he found the 500 person to kill and more. It, it can make you go crazy. Y you just want to tell them, like, it's me. It was bad, like, in my mind, I was so angry. My skin was just burning like you are on fire so angry and so fearful at the same time they came searching in the ceiling of the house they came under the beds the closets it was completely the grace of god that they did not find that bathroom and i remember when i was saying our lord's prayer and i remember reaching to that part that said forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us and all of a sudden, it was almost like a picture of all the killers was in front of me. Thousands, if not millions. And it was almost like Jesus was telling me, pray for them to change instead of hating them. Are you going to be like them? Are you going to do what you hate most, which is the genocide, the hatred? Are you going to do that? Or are you going to try to change them? So then I started to pray for them. It made all the sense. Truly, truly, there is a potential in every human being, in the worst person who have done the worst thing, there's a potential to be an angel. It is not poverty, our worst enemy. Our worst enemy is the truth that is not truth. It is the lies that are in our hearts that another person is less than another. Only through love, our country can get back together. Immaculate Elabugiza. She wrote the book, Left to Tell. It's a great book, but it's very powerful. She was Rwandan, and the Hutu and the Tutsis, were, there was a genocide going on, um, and uh, millions died. 1994 is when that genocide was. Her family was murdered during a killing spree that lasted three months, claimed the lives of, of nearly a million Rwandans, hundreds of thousands. For her... And it's a little hard to understand here, but she talked about surviving the slaughter for 91 days. She and seven other women, eight women, huddled in a bathroom of a local pastor. And they even searched a house and didn't find that bathroom. It was three feet by four feet. Eight.
eight women. And during those endless hours is when she discovered the power of prayer. Eventually lost her, shed her fear of death, as she puts it, and forged a profound and lasting relationship with God. This is from the book. This is afterwards when uh, one of the men was, uh, the, the man she was talking about who wanted to make her the 400th that she had killed and 400th cockroach, because that's how they viewed them. They couldn't view them as people. They viewed them as, as insects and brought that man to Immaculate. His name was Samana. I watched through Samana's office windows as he crossed a courtyard to the prison cell and then returned, shoving a disheveled, limping old man in front of him. I jumped up with a start as they approached, recognizing the man instantly. His name was Felician. He was a successful Hutu businessman whose children I'd played with in primary school. He'd been a tall, handsome man who always wore expensive suits, had impeccable manners. I shivered, remembering that it had been his voice I'd heard calling out my name when the killer searched for me at the pastor's. He's the one on the far right. He had not been arrested at that point. Felician had hunted me. Samana pushed Felician into the office and stumbled to his knees. Stand up, killer, Shimana shouted. Stand up and tell this girl why her family is dead. Explain to her why you murdered her mother and butchered her brother. Get up, get up and tell her. But the battered man remained hunched and kneeling, too embarrassed to stand up and face me. His dirty clothes hung from his emaciated frame in tatters, skin bruised and broken. The handsome face was filthy. I wept at the sight of his suffering. Felician had let the devil into his heart, and evil ruined his life like a cancer in his soul. He was now a victim of the victims. He looted your parents' home, robbed your family plantation immaculately. Your dad's farm machinery was at his house. After he killed Rose and Damascene, he kept looking for you. He wanted you dead so that he could take your property. I flinched, letting out an involuntary gasp. Samana looked at me, stunned by my reaction and confused by the tears streaming down my face. He grabbed Felician by the shirt collar, hauled him to his feet. What do you have to say to her? What do you have to say to Immaculate? Felician was sobbing. I could feel his shame. He looked up at me only for a moment, but our eyes met. I reached out, touched his hand lightly, and quietly said what I'd come to say. I forgive you. My heart eased immediately. I saw the tension release in his shoulders before Samana pushed him out the door and into the courtyard. Two soldiers dragged him away. Samana was furious. What was that all about, Immaculate? That was the man that murdered your family. I brought him to you to question, to spit on him if you wanted to. You forgave him? How could you do that? Why did you forgive him? I answered him with the truth. Forgiveness is all I have to offer. She took the right action and loved him. I came to realize that God never shows us something we aren't ready to understand. Instead, he lets us see what we need to see when we need to see it. He'll wait until our eyes and hearts are open to him. And then, when we're ready, he will plant our feet on the path that's best for us. But it's up to us to do the walking. Then Jesus answered his thought, Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 to the other, but neither could repay him. So he kindly forgave them, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust off my feet, but she has washed them with tears, wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, 
but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, are forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. We have been forgiven so much. My prayer as always is that may we in turn forgive much. We've been loved beyond anything that we can understand by, by God himself who sent his son. May we love back the other people in our lives, whoever they are. Don't waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you're behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love them. And I would add one thing to this when I wrote it and made the slide. I believe this absolutely, though. When we choose to love, it cannot be taken from us. We, that is in our power. We only relinquish it by our decisions and choices is what it says. I would add actions. We rel can only relinqu relinqu relinquish it by our decisions, our choices, and our actions. So may we choose rightly. Rightly.